I'm not going to dwell too much on the past because everyone knows the story up to and including, you know, the, the departure in 1983. But perhaps you could tell us a little bit um, about what happened next, because I know that you went on to to to, to record demos with with uh, with Ice House or, or Flowers, as maybe they were at that point. And then, of course, you worked with Dragon. But maybe not everybody knows that. So, so can you tell us a little bit about about your drumming experience when you moved to Australia? Well, um, I still had to put food on the table. And uh, at that particular point in time, that was the only source of, uh, of um, work I could find, I guess. Um, I, I must admit, I was a little disillusioned with the music business up at that point. So um, I sort of reluctantly ended up, um, well, working back in the business, I guess. Um, and as you say, I did a couple of demos there, um, mainly through our Australian agent uh, got me got me the work, um, Ray Hearn, who now lives in Japan. Um, and basically it worked from there. I, sp I suppose after about 18 months, once again, I, I thought, well, perhaps it wasn't as rewarding as uh, the XTC thing. And um, I decided to... Um, take a rest from it, basically. Did you think at that point that it was a rest and you, you intended at some point to, to pick up the sticks again? Or was there a definite decision that, you know, there's no money in this, as you say, I've got a family, I've got a feet, I've got to put food on the table, I've got to do something else? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the main um, thing, really having a small family and, and having to get sort of, um, some sort of steady income, I guess. So a daytime job was where I went, and um, which was a bit difficult, but um, I was home every night and um, with a young family, that's very important. Sure. Um, obviously, big jump then, because you, you're, you're not playing at all, as far as I'm aware, and, 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 if, and if I'm wrong, please put me right, but I don't believe you're kind of playing for, certainly not professionally, for an awful long time, until really you come back to Britain. Correct. Okay, so uh, what was the impetus to start playing again? Well, I, I came over, um, my brother's daughter was getting married and uh, I was invited to the wedding. So I came over uh, during that period of time. I was over for about two weeks during that period of time. Um, when I did come back to England on, on a few occasions, which unfortunately there was two funerals involved in that as well. So uh, one wedding and two funerals. Um, I, I usually sort of uh, got in contact with the guys, Andy, Colin and Dave. And, um, and on this occasion, I, I did exactly that. And Colin told me that um, he was working on sort of like a bit of a solo project. And would I be interested in um, having a listen to it and what my thoughts were? And um, we went out to a pub, as we always did which was always the foundation of uh, the early XTC stuff. And um, I thought, you know, what the hell? You, you know, you're a long time dead. I'll, I'll give it a go, despite the fact that I hadn't played for a long time. And, um, and Colin was a bit rusty too, because, I mean, he'd only done sort of um, studio work at that point in time for about the last 20 years. So, uh, but I thought, what the hell? just go for it and that's how the tc and i think sort of developed really was it a, a natural progression do you think uh, from recording the ep to wanting to go out and play live well i've always been keen on playing live i think that's pretty well documented and um in fairness to colin he he thought that um perhaps the time was right to see what um songs he'd recorded over the last 20 years would actually sound like on a in a live situation, which I was quite surprised at, but, um, and, and thoroughly got behind it. And he said, what do you think? I said, well, look, the only thing we can do is, is get in his studio and the pair of us sort of um, flog these things around for a little bit and find out whether we're sort of actually capable of doing it. Because uh, as I say, the ones um, over the last 20 years type of thing, um, I, I didn't originally play on, so I was then asked to walk in the footsteps of um, some brilliant musicians. 
were you surprised at all at the feedback you got from the audience at the T at the TCNI gigs? Well, I mean, that kind of very obvious outpouring of of love from that fan base and from people who had never seen XTC play live. Yeah, well, originally we only um, we weren't quite sure whether anybody would turn up at all, so we initially <laughs> only yeah initially um, we only. Um, decided to do two shows um, but the demand was such um, and people would travel from far and wide um, that we, we ended up extending the thing and doing six nights so um, it, was, it was quite sort of uh, humbling in a sense to think that um, people after all this time were, were, were still interested in it you know. And, and was it getting back on stage that kind of energized you again and felt like you wanted to carry on? Well, yeah, it was, um, I don't know, it was a born again moment, really. I thought, you know, and um, the, the response was very favourable. So I thought, well, perhaps there's a little bit of life in the old dog yet. And if I get myself as, as fit as I possibly can at my age, um, you know, perhaps there's, there's still a, 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 an opportunity to enjoy myself. And are you enjoying it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean... Um, Unfortunately, Colin decided that um, the six gigs were enough for him. But um, Steve Chilling and I got on very well during those um, uh, rehearsals and, and, uh, and those live uh, shows that, um, you know, we had a meeting and decided that, you know, this was a bit of fun and, and, and is there a chance of us continuing on, which is what we've done. We've had several different um, uh, people within the group uh, during that period of time and and people have come and gone um, during that period of time for various reasons. Um, but we're settled on a, on a, on a good um, band at the present and we've just recently done some gigs. So, um, yeah, uh, as with everybody, um, you know, everybody had 18 months there to sort of like put this thing together as, as we all know with the COVID situation. So thankfully we're out the other side of that as far as the uh, live situation is concerned anyway. Well, I was just about to ask you about that because obviously, you know, the lucky few of us got to see the first incarnation of the XTC back last March when you when you played at the Vic, and then immediately you're you're thrust into this, you know, mandatory eighteen month hiatus. Um, yeah. And they, and they, as you just said, we've come back out the other side now, but you've come out with a with a different lineup for for various reasons, and you've now played what half a dozen gigs, if not more, and there's more on the way. Yeah, uh, what's it like being back out on the road again after after that break? Well, it it was good fun, you know. Um, um, once again, it was um, one of those situations where we, we weren't quite sure as to what size venues we were going to be playing. Um, so we we sort of pretty much um, kept our feet on the ground and kept kept the gigs to uh, a pretty low key sort of you know, sort of 250 sort of capacity venues type of thing. Um, in the event that um, if it wasn't full up, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, we weren't sort of playing a massive auditorium there and going on to the sound of your own footsteps. So, um, yeah, so, and the response was very favourable. So we intend to continue on. Well, the response has been really favourable, hasn't it? I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to make a couple of those shows and, and it's, Again, you know, as I, as I was kind of mentioning earlier on, you've not only got kind of old school XDC fans, but you've got younger people coming in now who never saw that band play live. You've got people I know going to the gigs who don't know XTC at all and are being yeah. introduced to the music for the first time through, through what you and Steve and the rest of the band are doing. Um, are, are you surprised at how positive the feedback has been? Well, yeah. Um, not many bands... Um, have have a 40 year career you know um and, and and we're still selling xdc are actually still selling sort of cds and and um you know reissued vinyl and all this sort of stuff there so there's still an interest there and as you say um a lot of people weren't even born when when we actually finished as, as a live entity so uh, it's quite it's quite staggering really how did the isle of white gig go very well, yeah. I mean, we were fortunate enough to get that gig. Um, 
John Giddings, who used to be XTC's agent, actually has been running the Isle of Wight Festival since 1986. And uh, I rang him up initially to see what the possibilities of getting some gigs in pubs or clubs of that nature, um, what the possibility there was of that. And he said, well, look, um, I might have something for you. And um, he, he sort of got me back and said, look, what do you think about playing the Isle of Wight? And I thought, well, is he joking? You know, because <laughs> it, it's an unknown entity, you know? And I said, well, look, you know, you've got to realize it's only me in the original, from the original XTC band. And for all intents and purposes, um, we're sort of like a new band, you know? But he said, look, um, you know, if you're interested, there's a danger that you could be playing because it had been canceled from the year before, obviously for the COVID thing. And a lot of the bands, a majority of the bands anyway, from that time, um, were playing again this time. But they were, having said that, there was a few cancellations, as I understand it. And um, we were originally booked to play on the Sunday night. But um, unfortunately, um, the, uh, Steve, a guitar player, had a, had a gig on, on that Sunday already booked for, for a band that he was in, the, the, the Dead uh, Crow Road Band. And that couldn't sort of really be moved. So I had to go cap in hand back to John Giddings and say, Look, John, yeah, we'd like to do this thing, there, but we can't do it Sunday night. Uh, well, what's the charge of doing Saturday? And he said, well, yeah, OK, but you'll have to headline. So, I mean, instead of sort of like losing the thing completely, it was sort of, well, OK, well, we'll do that then. Because I said that After headline. five minutes was, yeah, it's remarkable the way it came around. I thought, well, I've really put my foot on it now, so it's on, you know. And, um, you know, there was a little bit of pressure there because, you know, it's a big event. And um, and to headline, well, it was headlining the river stage, actually, not the main stage, of course. But uh, even so, to get on there at all was quite a coup. I mean, that's the biggest gig anybody outside of the band has played it, or anyone in the band rather has played in in 30 years or so i mean if not longer uh that's yeah. a pretty big coup it is and um um we didn't have a great deal of time to sort of like think about it really when we got there because um these things are organized like uh you know because we weren't sort of like a real headlining band, although we were headlining that stage, we weren't one of the top acts. Uh, we weren't sort of um, flown in by a helicopter. And um, <laughs> thinking about if that was the case, I was going to throw myself out of the helicopter to, to get some headlines. But unfortunately, Liam Gallagher did that the day before. So <laughs> he, he sort of stuck with what I thought would be a, a sensational idea in order to get some decent press. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, that's a load of BS, but um, yeah, so we actually sort of went there in a, in, in a van and um, the, the organisation for some of the, um, the bottom feeders, for the want of a better expression, um, you know, you're sort of rushed in there and you've got about 10 minutes to set your gear up, you do a line check and then you're on. So um, there was no sort of uh, buggering about, really. And, um, but anyway, we all managed it fairly well and um, the reaction was very favourable once again. There's a large catalogue, there's best part of 200 songs in the XTC catalogue to choose from. Um, how have you decided what songs to include in the EXTC set? Are there, obviously there's stuff that you played with TC and I, which was, you know, the bulk of the original um, set 18 months ago, but how, how is it developing now? How are you, you choosing which material to use? Well, as I say, as you said earlier, um, we only played two gigs before this uh, pandemic sort of um, its ugly head. So uh, we're basically continuing on with that, that same sort of set because um, nobody's really sort of heard it. But uh, as, as regards to songs and that, I think um, we basically decided that um, um, when we played the TC and I stuff, it was predominantly all Collins songs, other than one token of uh, gesture towards Andy, which was Statue of Liberty. But uh, since we've taken this uh, EXTC thing sort of on board, um, we felt that uh, there were so many strong Andy songs that we needed to talk. And we, we've ended up about 50-50, really. 
So the whole thing there, we're, we're capable of doing two hours or two 45 minute sets. And then uh, for the likes of the Isle of Wight, for example, we had to trim the whole thing down there and just pick 45 minutes worth of songs. So uh, we do have two, two hours of material, but as you say, you know, there's, there's uh, so many songs to, to choose from that you can't play them all. Sure. So I, I think we've, we've, we've picked what arguably are the better songs, um, some of which I'm on, some of which I've, I didn't play on originally. And um, I, I, because we're sort of a four-piece band, which is guitar orientated, um, we've had to adapt these things here because there's a lot of keyboards involved and all that sort yeah. of stuff. So we also had to be careful of the songs that um, we, we could do justice to in, a, in, in this particular format. So, um, yeah, some of them we never went anywhere near, but um, because of layered keyboards and, and all this type of thing there, and it would have perhaps um, not been a, a decent interpretation of it uh, in, in, in some people's view. I know when we talked about this uh, a while back, I mean, again, pre-COVID, pre that, that first uh, Vic gig, um, you and Steve, I, I talked to you both individually, were talking about the possibility of of writing your own material, recording your own material, maybe at some point later. Are, are you in a process of writing writing your own stuff for the band at the minute, or are we just concentrate on an XTC? Not, not at the moment, we're not. No, we're just sort of trying to see how far we can go with this. And as I say, we're, we're sort of honing the band, really. As I say, we've had several band membership changes. And when we get, hopefully we've got the right formula now. Um, and once we get uh, the band sort of working in a, a live situation there and everybody's comfortable with each other, perhaps then, you know, it might be an opportunity then to freshen the setup with some original material. That's the intention. And I've actually penned a few lyrics today, actually, on, on one particular song, and it goes somewhat similar to this. Audrey's favourite jam is strawberry. Do you feel this song is ordinary? <laughs> that's, that's the start of this. That's fantastic. So um, make that of it what you will. So um, the wheels are in motion. It's, I'm going to move on to a bunch of questions that, um, that various people who are, you know, convention goers or potential convention goers have asked me to put to you. Most of them are musicians, so they've all got their own drubby thing going on. But, um, and I will try if I can't remember all their names. Those, in those individuals should start a band. Well, you know, quite a few of them are playing in XDC cover bands in a minute, yeah. or at least a couple of names that are going to get mentioned in a minute. Yeah. And um, Fossil Falls, one of the bands, are playing the Vic tomorrow. Yeah. So we're, so, yeah. we're recording this the day before the Fossil Falls gig, and we're recording that to broadcast as part of this online convention. So, um, all right, good for them. Anyway, so first up, Terry Arnett from, well, there you go, Terry Arnett would ask, um, after the prolonged absence from drumming up to TCNI, how did you approach getting back into uh, back up to speed for fitness and endurance? Well, good point. It's, it's not, not uh, easy when you, um, you know, you're 66. Um, but, you know, once again, if you're serious about what you're doing there, you, you have to have a professional attitude, I feel, and, um, you know, sobriety and um, sanity is, is sort of one of the important things there, although, although I do have a, a weakness and, and uh, a pension for drinking a few lagers from time to time, but um, that has to be combated by... You know, trying to remain fit, I, I, I run a bit and I've now got a bicycle and I rode and I played, um, you know, two to three hours a day on, a, on virtually every day for a long period of time. And, you know, started using things like practice pads, which I never used to use in the past. And a lot of these ideas came to me through my son who plays. Um, I mean, when, although I wasn't playing when I was in Australia, he decided that... Um, he wouldn't mind having a go at it when he was about 14 years of age. So, um, as that's a result, quite, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, so I sort of like stuck with it a little bit and showed him a few bits and pieces. So I, I dabbled in it a little, but, um, 
not to the extent where I wanted to sort of like uh, show show off to him and um, put him off or anything like that. So probably taught him a few bad habits actually. But um, from from that point of view, I, I, I remained um, sort of in touch with the drum kit, but not uh, seriously up until when I came back with Colin. When I thought, well, fitness is a very important thing. I mean, to me. You've only got to look at somebody like Sting, who does a lot of yoga. I don't get that involved in, in that type of thing, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, you only got to look at that guy there. I think he's 69 or nearly 70 now. And, um, you know, when he prepares for a tour, I mean, I remember when we played with him, he used to go for a run every day, you know, with uh, regardless of where we were. And I thought, geez, you know, um, I could only admire him for that. I was still trying to get a little bit of sleep from the night before, but... Um, you know, there's a guy that, at the top of his game, you know, uh, fitness-wise. And, um, you know, I mean, he's charging a lot lot for his for his appearances. So people want to see people there at their best. And and, and I feel that um, if you go on there and you're a bit of a shambles there, you're, you're an embarrassment to yourself and you don't deserve to be paid. And um, I just think I want to try and be as fit and as, as good as I possibly can to be up there. I don't want to hear people sort of saying, well, he should have left it where it was, you know. Yeah, I don't think you're going to hear that, not for a long time. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you know what the feedback's been like for every everyone who's seen the band play. I don't think that's, I don't think there's any likelihood of that happening. Yeah, um, I, don't want to drop, I don't want to drop the ball on this, you know, so I mean, as soon as when we're in, in that uh, live situation there, I want to be as good as I possibly can at this age. <laughs> I hate to keep mentioning that, but... Uh, <laughs> we're all getting older, man, you know. So Maybe, you, can't, yeah. you can't avoid it, can you? Absolutely not, no. Um, Ed Percival, another musician, there you go, uh, would like to know what your favourite XTC album is that you didn't play on. Yeah. Um, yeah, difficult to, to choose, but um, I suppose of those ones, I, I, I think uh, perhaps Oranges and Lemons. I think Pat Master Lotto did a fantastic job on that. Um, and... Um, I sort of like that album, yeah. Okay, great. Um, next question was from Alejandro, who was asking if you'd written any songs of your own, and you just demonstrated oh. with Audrey. Oh, her, um... uh, yes, that um, Audrey's favourite jam is Strawberry. Um, is a start, but um, in all seriousness, though, um, no, not at this point in time. I haven't really. I mean, I only play drums so it's quite difficult to sort of unless you like the likes of Phil Collins or someone like that that's uh, very good on the piano and so on and so forth it's uh, quite difficult to get your ideas across so um, yeah from a rhythmic point of view I suppose Steve Tilling and I and the rest of the guys in the band will, will nut these things out as we did with XTC although I didn't write the songs there quite a few of those things there have you know bits and pieces from a rhythm point of view that uh, Perhaps I should have got credit for, but um, you know, that's, do you that's find the way. yourself? Do you find yourself now with 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 the band as it is when you are rehearsing? Um, I don't know, jamming, locking into a groove, going off on a tangent, like all bands do anyway. Well, most of the time we do these jams, we're playing somebody else's stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, actually, see, we're a little bit like that too. We jam to all sorts of stuff there, from you know, disco to. Um, psychedelic uh, rock and um, all sorts of stuff we used to mess around with there just to sort of relieve the boredom at times. But um, yeah, and, and as it stands at the moment with, with the, um, the, the band that we're in at the present, we haven't really um, got into the songwriting thing there and we haven't really been jamming much outside of trying to get these songs together for the, for the, for the recent six gigs, really. Sure. Uh, Louis Barf, author and another drummer, uh, wants to know where does your sense of time come from? He says he, you're one of the steadiest drummers he's ever heard, never using a click track or anything. Did you work on it or is it instinctive? Well, I just um, tried to listen to what I considered to be the best drummers at the time. And, um, and those guys were sort of like rock solid. So I think it sort of like came from, you know, guys like Simon Kirk and that, that were just on it all the time, you know. Um, 
uh, I mean, rock steady just 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 springs to mind when he was playing with uh, Bad Company, for example. Um, and those guys, they never used click tracks or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, and I think, to me, it was that that's the purpose of a, of what a drummer's job is. He is the timekeeper. So to me, it seems a bit of a nonsense to sort of uh, have to use the aid of something else. I think if you if you know your job and, and you do your job properly, they, they, you shouldn't particularly need that. Unless, of course, it involves... Um, synchronized lights and synchronized dancing and this type of thing there which obviously a lot of type, types of music this day this day and age do whereas um we in our live set for example you know we slow things down and we drop things out and and it's a real feel about the thing and try and get the audience involved as well and yeah. if you've got the restrictions of um you know synchronizing with a drum machine you can't slow this thing down and drop out and and have that sort of rock and roll type of um, audience participation, really, without the thing falling flat. Sure, sure. Um, now one. I'm going to try and paraphrase this question. This is from Matt Bell. Um, as any musician, you've probably found that it's uh, an iffy. <laughs> Should we say iffy? It's an iffy business. What's been your approach to dealing with a large amount of? Um, unpleasant people you might encounter in show business? Well, I think our worst encounter um, in the past was the XTC manager, who was um, um, a chap that was not very... Um, um, his mad management skills were left a li little to be desired, to say the least. But I think as a result of that, Andy Partridge... Um, developed a lot of problems, you know, because he was being sort of like a, a horse that was being flogged to death. So um, not only that, but he didn't sort of make air NI contributions either for a long period of time. Um, I mean, that was it. But um, we didn't take too much notice of it at the time because we were happy to be sort of playing stuff and actually getting paid for it. So we didn't want, want to rock the boat. Um, we just didn't feel that... Um, we were being ripped off at that particular point in time. It wasn't until considerably late, later on that um, that obviously became evident. Sure. Okay. But, I mean, he's the one that, uh, he's the top of the heap if it comes <laughs> to uh, people. Yeah. Outside of that, um, you know, record companies are record companies and um, they're out for their own and, and that type of thing there. But uh, having a manager, you tend to get a little bit uh, cushioned from that. Um, and as regards agents and promoters, well, they generally take care of themselves. So, um, yeah, I never had a problem with any of them up to that point. No, but, um, Ian Reed, the XTC manager was certainly, um, you know, I mean, they broke the mold when, uh, <laughs> when he came along, but. Well, I, I know that, um, contractually, the other guys aren't allowed to talk about him. <laughs> and, yeah. um. So I know it's a, it's a diff, very different. I think lots of people know that it's a very difficult situation there, and uh, yeah. still one that's um, financially encumbered, should we say? But okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, Martin Borman would like to know if you would stop hiding. <laughs> if you would stop hiding at the back of the stage, have you thought about coming forward, maybe as um, the drummer in, say, King Crimson, or working at the side like one of the jazz band drummers? Um, because I mean, part of the audience have obviously clearly come to see you, and they're and they're only getting a glimpse behind the symbols. Um, well, that's one of those things. Uh, no, I, I don't really intend to come to the front of the stage. Uh, basically, other than the fact that we pl played the big stage uh, at the Isle of Wight, um, the majority of these places we're playing at the moment are small clubs, so you just got to sort of get where you can actually sort of fit yourself, uh, fit your backside in that particular place. So um, it's not a great deal of choice at the moment there, unless you are playing a big stage. And um, I don't know, I suppose from a visual point of view, a slightly higher drum riser may be of some advantage, but um, once, you, once again, um, the drum kit itself there tends to cover you quite a bit, but um, I mean, that's just the way, the way it is. I mean, that's, it kind of brings up another question, I guess, in, in that, 
do you see EXTC as a band that you're a member of, or is it your band? I'm a member of this group. We're, we are equally responsible for the good times and the bad times. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think uh, democracy is is the way to go. I I often think about um, the way that uh, you two have been successful. They have a complete um, a quarter share in in the whole thing, all the way through the songwriting and everything else. And I think that has put that particular band in good stead. Mm. Uh, and, and um, I, I think that approach is 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 commendable. I think uh, REM did pretty much the same thing. Exactly, you know. And um, I, I I I tend to think that that's the way to go. But um, that's just my opinion. Sean Ellis would like to know: Would you, as a band, consider playing full album gigs? So, would you take, say, the whole of English Settlement and do it from start to finish? Um, no. I've not really thought about that. That that um, suggestion was put to us earlier on in the piece about um, you know doing the white music thing and all that. I think um, quite a few of those songs there probably haven't aged as well as as perhaps some of the others, and um, I don't think I'd be sort of comfortable playing some of the earlier stuff at my age. Um, I think we're sort of like trying to trying to play the cream of the stuff that um, we we consider to do. Um, so f f to answer the question, no, um, I don't I don't think specialising in one particular album because there's so many to choose from, as as you said earlier. Um, and and you know I didn't really want to leave people disappointed, thinking oh we never played anything from there or never played anything from that. So. From a show point of view, um, no, I haven't really considered that. I think, uh, I mean, even XTC never decided to do that because it was all stuff from a try and bring new material involved. So, um, sure. I mean, world, it has, uh, I was going to say it has become yeah. quite fashionable over, over in recent years for bands to go out and do like an anniversary tour where they well where they will play an entire album. Um, the Wedding Present do it all the time, for example. They go out and play their entire, you know, 30-year-old master album and then and then do maybe, you know, a half dozen hits at the end. But um, I, so I guess that's the kind of the reason he's asking the questions. It has become, you know, lots of bands have done it, but it's not for you. Yeah, I, I don't think so, no. Um, we were asked at one point there whether we were going to do one of these 80s revival type things there. Okay. Uh, in, in, in America, which they seem to be quite popular, where you sort of half a dozen bands go on there and, and do their half a dozen hits or whatever. And um, we're going to go out there and do it on our own merit. And um, and we're not going to be involved with any of the other bands there. Um, so, no, um, I, I've got no intention to sort of going down that track just at the moment and doing the Butlins thing. Um, that's, that's not going to happen just at the moment. Okay. Uh, Deborah Wales, she would like to know what age you were when you took up drumming and how much time you dedicated to it growing up. I was 15 when I started. Um, and um, I used to play as regularly as I could, you know. Um, at that particular point in time, I was just sort of in the, uh, 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 the uh, point of sort of like leaving school and starting a job. And I used to play soccer and um, so I sort of gave up the soccer because I just sort of felt that um, I was getting more interested in in in, in music. And um, as I say, I started at fifteen, and um, I, I I played as much as I I could really in in like the fact that I was obviously still living with my parents, and uh, I didn't want to drive them and and my next door neighbours crazy uh, with it. Um, you know, it's like sort of. You know, it's, it's a little bit like learning the violin in a sense. It's uh, when you're learning the violin, it's a, it's a screeching, horrible noise, isn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> and are, are, are very much similar to that in a sense. When you haven't got that sense of rhythm and you're trying these things out, it can be quite painful for the uh, <laughs> for, for the for whoever's listening at that point in time. So, um, 
Yeah, I tried to play as, as, as often as I could because I realised that the more you played, hopefully the better you would become. Where were you practising at that time? I mean, you, in, in, in the kitchen, in, in the shed, in, in the garden? No, where? it was in my parents' uh, front room. Was where I, and they were okay I, with the noise? Yeah, well, my next door neighbour went crazy with it, but um, John, my, my, my mother came home one time there and said, there's something wrong with John in the backyard. I said, what's up with him? She said, well, he's walking up and down the, the backyard there with a biscuit tin, bashing it like this sort of thing. I, and um, I said, well, I couldn't hear a thing. So he was out there just just joining in. But um, he was a retired school teacher. I don't think he got on with it very well. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, it was only during daytime sort of things there of a Saturday morning, that type of thing. And um, yeah, whenever you could without sort of disturbing the peace too much and upsetting too many people. So it's a very difficult thing to, I mean, Luckily for the young fellows today, they've got electronic kits there and they can use headphones and stuff. But um, obviously back in the day when I was doing it, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the case. <laughs>